the first question I'd like to ask is how we met. Do you remember how we met? I think I, I remember you directed that. You directed a, a short a play. A short I wrote. play that you wrote. Yeah, How's at the, the lyric. lyric. Yeah. Yeah, 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 in the studio. I can't, I can't remember, remember who was in there. It was about these two young girls. Yeah. It was beefing, they were like, had a relationship, and yeah, one was yeah. Yeah, toying with the other. Because I couldn't watch it, I was working. So I couldn't yes. Watch it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think maybe that's, that's why I always think you're West, but you grew up in South London, right? South. 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 Yeah, yeah. That's so you're a full on Brixton boy. Um, <coughs> yeah. So, so your parents, uh, if, again, I'm, this is from memory, like one Jamaican parent, one Ghanaian parent? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah. Was, which was which? And Mum's gone in, that's yeah. Jamaican. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I grew up kind of like a bit more like steeped in like Ghanaian culture. Okay. More so than Jamaican, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because I find it interesting. I think in the UK that um, until very recently, black culture was Jamaican culture in so many ways. Not exclusively, obviously. There's so yeah. many other places and areas, islands and what have you. It still is. And, and I feel like that's probably why, because I, I I kind of I grew up with my dad for part of my life, but not all of my life. Right, yeah. But still have a very strong connection to Jamaican culture. Yeah. Because Black British culture, as you said, was yeah. Jamaican culture. Yeah. But also like completely steeped in Ghanaian culture with my gran and my mum oh. and, and that, that side of my family. Yeah. Way cool. Way cool. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And your first introduction to theatre was age fourteen. Is that correct? Yeah, somewhere about that. I think well, I was What 14. was it? What would you, what's in your memory, what was that? So, um, I used to go to a school called Tennyson's, Archbishop Tennyson's. No way, um, up the road from... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oval. Um, and I left school, like, one afternoon, and I needed to pee. We just bunked off? No, 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 no. It's <laughs> in, like, school was finished. <laughs> okay, yeah. And I left school, and I was like, I need to pee. And I, didn't, I couldn't be bothered to walk back. <laughs> and it literally is on the same road. Yeah. Just like before the tube station. Yeah. And so I walked you in. You said where? Oh, in Oval. No, no, but Oval oh, where? House. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I walked in. I didn't know it was a theatre. I just, <laughs> it was just some building. Went in, used the bathroom, came back out, and they gave me these flyers, and it turned out to be Oval House Theatre. And I joined their, like, um, youth theatre programme. But first I was, like, I was doing music. Yeah. Um, I used to sing, play keys, Whoa. and stuff like that, so... Yeah, I was doing like music production and, and songwriting know. and stuff like that. Yeah. And then uh, I got asked to do a play called um, Chat Room by Ender Walsh. Yeah. And got asked to play the lead character, Jim, and I'd never really acted before. And so every day I was like, I can't really do this. And there was, there was like, you know, when you're a teenager, there's all sorts of things going on and, and the entire world just seems like way too big. And there was just, there were way too many like overlaps between me and this character. There was just something incredibly like therapeutic about the experience of like going on stage and speaking this kid's words and the hope that the play kind of offered at the end mm. so that kind of was it for me after doing that play I like I believed I was going to be an actor right and then I met people like you um, <laughs> and decided that I should just like leave it and started to write and then got into directing well, wow. okay, well, I want to ask about directing then. So after you've made that transition, you want to direct, where did you, like, train and what were your steps towards making that real? I went to Rosebruford College. Yeah. I told my grandma that I was going to the <laughs> University of Manchester. <laughs> because that is, that, that was, because um, <laughs> they were doing the, the like, uh, accreditation for my course. Okay. It's a weird thing, because most drama schools are actually linked to... Yeah, so That's, the university this is really rather. boring, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. so I told... <laughs> I was going to University of Manchester, and that was doing English literature. Wow! Um, and because I, she wouldn't have been able because to. Because she, I mean, she basically was like, "You have to go to university, or you need to get out the house." Wow! Because you know she didn't go to university. Neither yeah. of my parents did. Okay. My older brother and sister, you know, obviously, like coming from that background of like you know really ambitious immigrant families, they went on and you know finance. IT, and then I decide that I want to say, stand there, stand there, yeah, as far yeah, as yeah. they're concerned. And so it was, it was quite difficult, I guess, to like convince them that I was going to go to fit, like get into fit. So I said, yeah. I was doing English. And it was only before I graduated that I like <laughs> basically came out as a director to my family. <laughs> I love it. Mom, <laughs> I'm a director. <laughs> yeah, but, but it was actually quite wonderful because, like, you know, even though they didn't really get it, yeah. they were still really proud that I'd committed, 
committed three years to a degree. Yeah. And they came to my graduation, you know, in Ankara Prince, everything. Yeah. And they were just like so proud. And, you know, it was a very like British ceremony and yes. the gowns and everything. And everyone's like really quiet and clapping small. And then they call my name and like the whole tear at the top is like, Vuvuzelas. <laughs> 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 um, Vuvuzelas. <laughs> um, yeah, but so, so, so yeah, I, but I basically, so yeah, I went to Rosebery for college um, and I did a directing degree there. Um, and the course is like, it doesn't exist anymore, which I think is really sad. Okay, so that course really shaped you, did it? Did it like? Yeah, I think it really did. I mean, there were a number of things and, and a number of people actually that I think really shaped me as well. But, but that course was amazing. There were like a couple of like projects that might have even lasted maybe as long as like two weeks. Where yeah. There was like one phrase that yeah. might have been said by the the visiting lecturer or tutor or director that we were working with. That Real talk is, it was the same for me, but like drama school, I, I thought if you'd asked me a couple of years after leaving, I'd have been like, ah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, yeah, I yeah, yeah. did it all myself. Yeah. And then over the years, I've realised how much I've lent on, even before drama school, but certainly during, yeah, yeah, yeah. training that I've, I've get, get, received and mm -hmm. wisdom. Do you have any, can you remember any phrases or any, is there any maxim you use that is like, oh, yeah. As an but, actor, I have one that's like, on, stand still and tell the truth. Which somebody said, they were just like, just stand still and tell the truth. That's like, actually oh, yeah. really good. That's a really good note. <laughs> yeah. Just, Don't yeah, just yeah, do yeah. something, stand there, in fact, was, what, was the way he said it. And then yeah, he went on yeah, to explain, yeah. stand still and tell the truth. Yeah. Was there anything like that from you, from any choice um, words? Why not, but why? So like, why not have... 50 million balloons yeah. dangling from the, apart from the fact that that is really bad for the environment. Yeah. But like, <laughs> you know, why not have, you know, a massive chainsaw flying in? Yeah. But why? Like, what is the reason? Yeah. Like everything is possible yeah. until it doesn't make sense for the story. Brilliant. And, and I feel like that allows me to, to like have a real freedom in terms of like the ideas that I play with. And it allows me to be really like wild and imaginative. Yeah. Um, but also reminds me to like honor the text, I guess. And I think there's something really humbling about the but why bit, because like it means that, you know, your justification has to be more important. Yeah. Um, the play has to be more important than your ego or your ideas or just because you think it will look good or, yeah. you know, yeah. make people gasp or whatever. It has to be about story and what story. it is. It's to serve the, serve the story. So following on from that, I saw some of your early productions. I saw Mountaintop. You won the, you won the JMK Award. Yeah. And that was the production you got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. superb. And then I have in my notes here that um, Stoneface by Eve Lee was one of your other flagship productions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you go about choosing those? I mean, what, what, what drew you to them and what, what was the theatrical gesture you were <laughs> trying to make? Yeah. Um, Stoneface was... The first, yeah, it was the first play I did before The Mountaintop. Eve essentially was writing a story about the failure of the welfare state in this country. Basically created this story that was about two sisters, like, who have grown up in this, like, family where they were abused, but one gets away. I guess the big gesture of that play was that we cast one actor to play both parts. To see, like, I guess, in, in one body you see the possibilities of the two lives yeah basically um, yeah. so that was I guess the theatrical gesture of that but there was also like lots of like random flickering projections of like parliament and stuff like that like, yeah we, we really wanted the audience to like I guess to like think about the wider context of where these like where the problems that this young girl is facing yeah. kind of stem from. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, M almost motivated by apathy. Yeah. The two opposites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Golden. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. So that was that one. Kudos, kudos. Like, be real. Like, how does it feel to make work here, good or bad? You know, what's, what's, it, what's your experience been like? Look, your first production here was Nine Night. Yeah. It was an enormous success, transferred to the West End, to London's Glittering. And then uh, Marcel Howard on the boys, there's a buzz about it. I can say that, you can't. But there's been a, <laughs> been a buzz about it. You've got all these like wonderful people cast in it and it looks, it looks exciting just, just based on the paper facts. How have you felt working here? Um, yeah, like um, making work here and how do you feel about your future? 
I kind of think like, what? I can't believe that they asked me to come back. <laughs> um, or that they asked me to do Nine Night in the first place. Yeah. Um, I feel really lucky. Yeah. I feel really, really supported yeah. here. Yeah. It's like almost anything that we want to do is made possible. Like within reason. Yeah. Not that like there are endless budgets or anything like that, but just yeah. that like people say yes or people find a way to say yes. Cool, with um, the willingness, yeah. Yeah, the willingness to like make it happen, mm. to make sure that like you're certain of the choices that you want to make and not mm. just because of financial reasons, but because of like, you know, really solid dramaturgy in the building throughout yeah. different departments. Yeah. Yeah, so people are kind, they get stuff done, it's very exciting um, to hear that, that your ideas and the themes you describe are supported and that the, the maximum you offered right from the beginning, why but why not, can be alive in yeah. a place this big. Because yeah. sometimes with big institutions, they're just not very agile. But it's good to hear that, that that's, there's, there's, there's blood here. You know? There really is, yeah, good. completely. And good. I think it is absolutely from the top down. Like everybody, producers, production managers, stage crew, yeah. like everybody cares, yeah. really, really cares about the work. Um, like our, our tech has been like insanely smooth. Sweet. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't talk too much because yeah, it's the, yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> but techs are techs are notoriously the most yeah. unpleasant parts of the rehearsal mm. period. I wanted to ask about uh, future, like what yeah. your future looks like, and building on these successes, building on the strength and the support you've had. What is it? Wh what is what's what? Are, what can we expect? You're now. The co-artistic director, is joint that right? Artistic the director. joint artistic director of the Manche Manchester Royal Exchange Theatre, the National of the <laughs> North, many say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a bit about future and perhaps, a, I don't know, do you have aspirations to screen stuff or uh, what, what's the, what's the manoeuvre for um, the Kruger? Yeah, so I mean it's really weird because about a year ago I was like, I don't want to be an artistic director, Yeah. I just want to be a director. And actually like, something that has drawn me to, to like, I mean I love the Royal Exchange, I, I'd been there many times before I'd even been to like some of the most prominent theatres in London. Mm. Um, and that was like on my own accord, travelling up there, um, and I just have a real connection with the city but something that I guess I encountered um, after doing like Nine Night is that like you know I met lots of people and you know suggested different shows that I wanted to do and I have no choice but to get political but like I think that that like because of who I am yeah because of what I look like yeah and everybody knows what I'm saying yeah the option in terms of or options in terms of like the kinds of stories that I might be like the viable director for yeah. became incredibly limited to yeah. an experience specifically about the oppression that is related to my skin colour. Yeah. When the opportunity for to work with Bryony at the Royal Exchange came up, it felt like really important to to like move towards that challenge because I know that because of my own experiences, I can say, right, I'm going to trust the artist and, and kind of like crash open the ideas of like, who can tell what stories and yeah. who is allowed in what spaces and who is allowed to like, you know, create the fullest expressions of their own like uh, experience. Yeah. So that I guess is the hope for the Royal Exchange um, and to really, really broaden like what audiences look like in theatre as well and, and you know, Building on, I guess, the success of like Nine Night um, and what we did with that, and how hard we pushed to like bring in like people who who maybe wouldn't have felt like the theatre was a home for them, and making it feel like they are absolutely welcome. Yeah, uh, you know, the great thing about the Royal Exchange is that it's in the round, and so you have no choice but to look at other people and experience like an, a story through somebody else's eyes. Yeah, it's pretty ultimate, yeah. ultimately theatrical. Yeah, absolutely. Because you can never escape the uh, artifice. The, and the community element of it as well. So, yeah. so that's something that I'm really looking forward to, but also really scared of never like yeah. lived outside of London. <laughs> <laughs> oh, have you not? No, okay, but I cool. like Manchester though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. slit, yeah. the nightlife is dope. <laughs>
and anyone that knows me. Anyway, tell me about um, like screen versus theatre. That's what I was curious about. Yeah, like. I, I, I think I do. I, like I, again, like last year in in like my like very early midlife crisis, <laughs> um, I, I was, I, I kind of had really, really exciting conversations with like really wonderful um, production companies in TV and wow. film. And I just started to pay a bit more attention to the reach that screen has. And, and you know, I feel like sometimes like in theatre, we operate on very like archaic structures and archaic yeah. like ideas. Yeah. And, um, and I think because there's a lot more money <laughs> in yeah. screen and TV, like, I don't know, the boat is pushed out a little bit further. Let um, me challenge that. Go on. Because, because I think that what we describe about structures, there, there is, there are, uh, there's archaic, uh, there are archaic systems, but there are also uh, fresh possibilities in both. Yeah. And I think with TV and screen and films, film particularly, there is such a there's such a, a an onus on the bottom line that people mm. are unwilling to take what they consider to be risks mm. when it's not in fact a risk. Yeah. Um, so is there is there something about um, the scope for telling stories in a new way and with new people that is sometimes I think theatre is slightly farther ahead than screen is in that in that That's regard. really interesting. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes I feel I the feel the, the opposite. Okay, yeah. I feel like I go into my Netflix and I can see like and it's Netflix, you know, but I can see yeah, there's yeah. such a variety of stories. It's a bigger platform. Yeah. I guess with a lot more money and, and theatre comes and goes. But I think, you know, like I, I, I do genuinely believe that sometimes like the idea that like artists are constricted to the experience that someone else believes that they yeah. and capable of telling. Yeah. Um, I, f I like, I really find that in theatre, like, and, and you know, like when writers are commissioned, it's like when you commission a woman, is it because you want her to write a, a really like big, massive, existential feminist drama with yeah. 10,000 like female characters or something like yeah. that, uh, rather than like, you know, a, a woman writing her own experience or, or you know or, or like a disabled artist who 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 wants to just write whatever love story they want to write like you know there are many theaters that would take that script where she's written about Jim and Sally falling in love in a park and and be like but where's the person in the wheelchair or yeah where's the, yeah. the person with down syndrome do you know yeah. what I mean like yeah. Um, and I think that also has something to do with like the the struggle that we have here with you know, it's an amazing thing, the Arts Council, but like also the, the box ticking and the data that has to go with that as well. I think sometimes we, we kind of like, like the angle in, with which we engage with artists can sometimes be like polluted by the political stuff yeah. and, and the box ticking stuff. And I think, you know, it's actually something that you said that I quote all the time about quotas and quotas being like really important because they're an interruption to institutions. But that sometimes, that information isn't always, like what is the freedom that you give to those artists once you get them into the, the yeah. building, you know? Yeah, there's a constant balance, I think. In my experience of, of thinking about these things, there's a constant balance between what you have to put, put in place to disrupt, inhibit, recalibrate the, the existing systems, mm. and also what you need to unlock to just let freedom, to let things yeah, flow. Yeah, yeah. You, know, yeah. you want people to tell their stories, mm -hmm. but you also want people to tell everyone's stories. Yeah, you want you, you sort of want every, you want the two things that appear to oppose each other, you want them all in. Yeah, And that's completely. the thing, that's the thing, isn't it? Mm. Everyone is as good and as bad as everyone else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The issue isn't whether or not yours or my experiences because of how we look or the experiences of someone who's a wheelchair rider or the experiences of women it's not that their experiences are narrow and therefore need to be heard or treated in a specific way it's that all possibilities are possible but what has ended up happening perhaps is that people think what is normal is um white wealthy maleness that's normal that's the normal jump that's the yeah. jumping the point and that from everything jump. else is like a, a, a kind of like a niche version of that new yeah, thing and actually yeah. like Actually, that's, you know, experiences are, yeah. Experiences, you know. I'm so excited. I'm not ashamed to say I believe in you. That's dope. Yeah, it's, Thank it, you. It, that, there's that means so a lot. much about what you describe and um, how you work that excites me. And that I, 
I wish I could be more rigorous and unpleasant in, in, in this interview, but, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I can't. All Thank goals. you, man. Shake that port. Nice. See you <laughs> whenever next. Thanks, yeah.